Thank you very much for inviting me tonight. As you heard, my name is Paul Gracie. I am a docent at the Mount Wilson Observatory. I have been in the docent there since 2012, shortly after the station fire made them need some more docents. And in 20, 2011, uh, I uh, volunteered to take the training course. Uh, they still have training courses for docents up there. Anybody looking for something to do in their old age? Anyhow, so my talk tonight is going to be uh, a little bit about the, um, the, the tour that I give, but more about the things that I don't talk about on the tour. So I will have some things that you probably didn't know about Mount Wilson. And I'll take questions afterwards, of course. So things you probably did not learn on the tour you took, if you took the tour. I don't know. Has, has anybody here taken the tour on Mount Wilson? Three times. Oh, three times. Wow. OK, a few of you. All right. So there was an observatory on Mount Wilson before there was the one that George Ellery Hale created that we all know about. In about 18, the 1880s, the rather new University of Southern California thought they might want to have an observatory similar to the Lick Observatory that Berkeley had at, uh, in, on Mount Hamilton in, uh, outside of San Jose. And so they invited people from Harvard and uh, Alvin Clark and uh, Professor Pickering from Harvard and a number of other notables to examine whether the Mount Wilson would be a suitable place to build a telescope bigger than the Lick. In other words, Lick the Lick. <laughs> the rivalry between Northern and Southern California goes on to this day. But this is what Harvard brought in 1889. And for 18 months, they were on the mountain with this 13 inch photographic refracting telescope. It was an Alvin Clark and it had come from Cambridge and they had hauled it very laboriously up the mountain uh, on a sledge and mount, built a mount for it and then built this rather crude looking cabin with uh, a dome that could be turned and there was in fact a shutter. That's what made it a photographic telescope. It had a way of turning the, the starlight on or off by opening up that shutter that's on the top. The winter of 1889 was one of the coldest on record in the 1800s and this is what it looked like at that time. They uh, did discover that Mount Wilson had some of the best seeing in North America, if not the world. And so that is the one of the reasons why uh, the Mount Wilson Observatory eventually was put up there. In the case of this observatory, they worked it for 18 months. In the summers, there were people that would come up the mountain to get out of the heat in the valley and uh, they would be able camping. There was a Martin's camp and there was a, uh, uh, another camp. I forget the name at this point. But the two camps up there were very popular to get out of the heat. And the campers would sometimes go up and beat on the door of this observatory and say, hey, hey, is there anybody in there? Hey, what you guys doing in there? Bang, bang, bang. Sleeping. They were astronomers, of course. So, George Ellery Hale was uh, trained at MIT. And he, uh, when he was going there, uh, had, you know, his father had given him a small telescope when he was a kid and then a larger telescope later on. And when he finished with uh, his work at MIT, he uh, married his sweetheart and they took a, a uh, 
honeymoon to the Lick Observatory in also San Francisco, always a nice place to go. And then knowing that Alvin Clark and Sons had a pair of large lenses that had been expected to be built on this mountain by USC. Hale would have built the Yerkes Observatory that I, you saw on the previous slide up at Mount Wilson if Mr. Yerkes and the university would have let him do it. The lenses were originally ordered by USC. And then an E.F. Spence was a banker in Los Angeles who was proposing to put the money forward to uh, grind the lenses and polish them. And he had the temerity to die without leaving them the money in his will to USC. So these lenses were languishing in the uh, Alvin Clark Optical Works in Cambridge. And so George Ellery Hale, uh, a Chicago boy raised by his father who had made a fortune building elevators. He knew about these lenses when he went to uh, MIT and had to take, by the way, he had to take his astronomy courses at Harvard because MIT at the time did not have an astronomy course. So he had to go down the, down the street. So these, this is the observatory that he built before Mount Wilson. This is still the world's largest optical, I mean, refracting telescope with two lenses. That takes two lenses to make a refracting telescope, at least. You either use two or three if you happen to have an apochromat. So this is, I've seen this. In fact, I took these pictures myself uh, just about a week before this observatory, unfortunately, closed to the public for good. The University of Chicago had been funding it for all these years and they finally decided that they weren't going to fund it anymore. So on the day that I took these pictures, they were cleaning out the library and I talked to one of the docents there and he gave me a special tour, uh, taking me into some of the places that they don't usually take people on the tour. And I suggested to him that they do what we do at Mount Wilson, that is to say, give to, uh, you know, get people to donate money, a bigger sum than what they would do to look through the telescope, and they do that. So they may put together what we have now at Mount Wilson, the Mount Wilson Institute, and that's what I'm a part of. The Mount Wilson Institute replaces the Carnegie Observatories. The Carnegie still owns the, uh, the uh, telescopes up there, but we, the docents, help pay for the maintenance and the upkeep and you, the public, coming up and seeing our concerts in the dome, our lectures in the uh, museum uh, lecture hall, you help to keep it in running condition. Now that's my, that's my plug, let's move on. <laughs> uh, as I say, this uh, is closed now, but it is still the world's largest. And this, is on Mount Wilson now, but the picture you see here was taken in the basement of the Yerkes, the Yerkes uh, Observatory, where George Ellery Hale's father wanted to build a reflecting telescope. All you needed was a big piece of glass. This is the 50, the, yeah, the 60 inch, piece of glass about nine inches thick, weighs about a ton, and it is now at Mount Wilson. Now, his dad had already given him an observatory on the grounds of Kenwood, the estate that they lived on in Chicago. And the University of Chicago had given George Ellery Hale, they had given him a position after he matriculated from MIT as the head of astronomy at the University of Chicago. In part because he had this already and the university thought it would be a good addition to the university. Hale, of course, had wanted to build this and so he talked Mr. Yerkes into doing that. The uh, fact is this 
as I say, belongs to the University of Chicago, and uh, Yerkes would not see it where it was originally intended to go on top of Mount Wilson. So it ended up in Williams Bay, Wisconsin, not the best place in the world for an observatory, but a lot better than downtown Chicago. Hale had bigger ideas once he got to Mount Wilson. And there it is. Now this is the 60 inch dome on Mount Wilson. And I took this picture on a day when there were TV cameras up there and also uh, other docents with their tel telescopes because there was an event, the transit of Mercury. Now the transit of Venus has passed. None of us and none of our children will be able to see it probably uh, the next time it comes around. But the transit of Mercury happens fairly frequently. Frequently On this occasion, it happened on a Monday and people stayed away in droves. They, uh, they, the TV was there, I was there, obviously the other people were there. Uh, and what happened was, you'll see a picture later on of me and the, all the clouds below the top of the mountain. When they drove into the clouds, apparently people just turned around and went home thinking there was going to be nothing to see. Now, back to the history. The 60-inch mirror was moved to California, obviously, here in Pasadena, and this is the laboratory where uh, George Ritchie of Ritchie Chrétien fame, fame, George Ritchie was the master optician who ground and figured the 60-inch telescope. And this is what it looked like when it was in Pasadena. Now to get what was the, at the time, the biggest telescope in the world, the 60-inch, this is in 1906, 1907, they had a special truck built. Now you see a team of mules here, but behind that team of mules is a, an electric truck. Each of the wheels there has an electric motor in it, and both axles can turn so that it can go around the sharp bends on this, the, the widened Mount Wilson toll road. The reason why that the observatory exists on Mount Wilson is there was already a road up there big enough to get up there on mules. They had to widen it six to six feet in order to bring this truck up. And that is the fork that is part of the mount for the 60 inch today. There is the tube for the 60 inch on the same truck, this time only one team of mules. Uh, there are two drivers on the truck and the truck, as I say, wasn't an electric truck. It was battery powered originally and it was, uh, they took the batteries off and they put a Fairbanks Morse engine on it in order to uh, get enough electricity to get all the way up the eight and a half miles to the top. And there it is. Now, in the, the dome of the 60 inch telescope, this is how they put together the central uh, axis. You can see this part is the wheel that drives it across. This, this axis is on a parallel with the Earth's axis. So this is an equatorial mount, but it's a fork mount, unlike the German equatorial that you saw with the Yerkes, which was a very classic type of telescope. This is a fork mount. It's uh, floated. This is a float. It's floated on liquid in order to uh, suspend it smoothly. And there's a, a wheel here with gears that's used to slew it. The tube is hollow, and this telescope has three focal points. On the tube at the top is the Newtonian focus. Halfway down is the Cassegrain focus, which is a bent Cassegrain, and then flip the mirror over the other way, and you can send the light down this tube to another room at ground level that would hold a spectrograph. You see, George Ellery Hale was interested in the spectrum and the science of the stars. The sun, he had the solar observatory first, and then he had, okay, there's, there's, 
The man who gave the money for the 60 inch, that's Andrew Carnegie, the one time he was ever at Mount Wilson. And as you can see by the picture, it wasn't a good day, day for looking through it, but of course he, was, he didn't wait around till night anyhow. He, uh, he had his picture taken. He was 70 years old in this picture and um, they were worried about his uh, age and how fragile he might be. So they built a special uh, rig to get him up to the observing level, about 25 steps up from this, from the, pardon me, from the door here. There's a staircase that goes up. And when the pictures were taken, he ran up those stairs like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> I tell this because, of course, I'm 77, and I still do the steps at a, at a good pace. But then, of course, riding a bicycle across the United States didn't hurt. The name of the observatory for until 1917 was the Mount Wilson Solar Observatory. That was, of course, because there were three solar telescopes up there, and this one was before either of the three that are up there now. This one was a portable solar telescope of the type that was usually used for eclipses. Before Mount Wilson, solar telescopes were only brought out during an eclipse. They'd, they'd clean off a portion of a, of a mountain ridge under where the eclipses can be seen, and then they'd set it up, wait for the eclipse, do their measurements of the eclipse, and then put it away and wait for the next one. So George Ellery Hale wanted to study the sun more carefully, and he actually built this one, and then of course he borrowed the Snow Solar Telescope from the University of Chicago, given by Miss Helen Snow uh, with the money that her father left her, uh, to the University of Chicago, and Hale borrowed it permanently. Uh, it wasn't intended originally, but after they took the uh, canvas tent off and put on a permanent, it's still there. there there's corrugated metal, two layers, and it's uh, the world's, it was the world's largest solar telescope at the time that it was built in 1905. It was a bit of a problem. It had uh, images that weren't steady during the height heat of the noontime from about 11 o'clock until four o'clock in the afternoon uh, it was often very, not very useful. So George Ellery Hale built also the world's first vertical solar telescope, the 60 inch, 60 foot solar telescope, which is right beside the snow. And then they built this one, the 150 foot solar telescope, twice as big. And this is the one that we take on, take people into tours, uh, you know, on the tour, and uh, the observer there who has been working for over 40 years, Steve Padilla, still talks to the people on when they come to do our tours. Um, this, is, well, this is an old picture. This was taken back when it was built. It's been upgraded since then. Now, Hale was not all work. Once in a while, you could catch him napping. Here's one. The toll road, of course, got wide, wide enough for uh, automobiles to come up, but originally the toll was 50 cents if you ride a mule, 25 cents if you walk, and you might have to rent the mule. Uh, there, the first automobile to go up to the top of the toll road when it was widened this wide was a 1907 brand new Franklin Air Cooled from Rochester, New York. And when he got to the top, the uh, newsmen who had come up the day before, probably on mules and stayed at the hotel, they asked him, well, sir, how did you enjoy your ride up to the top of the mountain? He said, I paid my 50 cents. You'd have to pay me $500 to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> now, that picture of Andrew Carnegie was taken in 1910. In 1906, before the 60 inch was even tested, and they would know that it would work, George Ellery Hale had already ordered 
a 101 inch glass of disc, four and a half tons of glass, biggest piece of glass in the world at the time from the Mantois brothers outside of Paris. That's the Saint Gabin glass works. And then started building this. So this was being built around 1915 or so. The dome you see there was originally built in Chicago. Uh, it was designed by the Daniel Burnham Company uh, uh, of architects, uh, well respected at the time. And uh, I don't think it's architecturally any great wonders, but it is, of course. They built it in Chicago and then they took it apart and shipped it by Santa Fe out to Los Angeles and that's how the dome got here. So, now here's the, uh, that piece of glass that was in the harbor in 1908 before they even knew that the 60 inch would work. And as you can see, maybe you can see, it's full of bubbles. George Ritchie and George Ellery Hale looked at it and said, oh, tell the French to try again. And they tried six times. By the time they had uh, stopped trying because there was something going on, I think it was the Great War, yeah, uh, they uh, had to make a choice. And George Ellery Hale had another uh, optician come in and look at it and he said, well, we're not going to have to dig more than about, grind more than about an inch deep into the glass. And there's no bubbles in that section. I think we can do it. So they did. And in 1917, in July, close to the 4th of July, because that's what the flags are for, they brought this up, the final polished, Richie polished it anyhow and they brought it up to the mountain and installed it in the 100 inch stone. Here is part of that installation procedure. And if you look behind it, there's this wheel here. That wheel is as big as the 200 inch on Mount Palomar. George Ellery Hale not only built the world's largest telescope, Three times, he built it four times. He didn't see the completion of Palomar, but he did build a telescope as big as that wheel after this one. Now, in, the, uh, in this picture, you can see the, uh, the various ways that they used to get it ready to get in, put into place. Uh, let me do it this way. They were worried that they would have trouble with this glass because of all the bubbles in it. And so they built it so that it could be refrigerated. And that's something that most people don't know, that this uh, had refrigeration coils in it in the early days. They've taken them out, they redid the whole apparatus for the holding of the glass in place. But the refrigeration is something that I, I think most people don't know about, and it's not on the tour. One of the things that this biggest telescope in the world at the time needed was this apparatus, and this is a workman testing it. The telescope tube is laying down about as low as it can to the northeast, and he's checking out how close he can get to what is the Cassegrain focus for this telescope. There are three focuses for this telescope, just like there are for the 60 inch. By the way, this piece here, that is the finder scope. Now, I happen to have a 10 inch telescope that I bring out to the, to the outings. That's a 10 inch finder. The man, who, the man who designed the, this telescope was Francis Pease. And you can see him here in this, sitting on what's known as the diving board. And he's at the, the, the uh, Cassegrain focus. You would, an observer would have to sit there like he is sitting and keep a small 
a side telescope with crosshairs pointed at a guide star for four hours until he was relieved by his night assistant at around midnight. And then they would do it for another four hours. Uh, George Ellery Hale insisted no coffee, no liquids, nothing that could possibly fall onto the mirror. So they had to be up there in the cold, in the dark, without anything to keep them awake. And they had to keep adjusting the crosshairs. This telescope was built with the, you know, 95 tons with the precision of a Swiss watch. But that wasn't enough. In order to stay on the object in the sky they were trying to get a photograph of, they had to use a human and guide stars. Nowadays you can do it with electronics, but in those days you had to use a guide star. Okay. For uh, the first few years until 1935, the mirror was coated with silver and the silvering was done in a room below the, uh, the telescope and this very very large jack screw it's still there down below we don't use it anymore but it is there to take the mirror cell down into the lower section and there is the silvering room it took it had to be done every three to six months and it took a lot of time to do it and it was a big bother this is a coffer dam that they built around the mirror and they would fill it with the caustic chemicals to uh, deposit a new layer of si silver on the top surface of this reflecting telescope. That is how reflecting telescopes work. So in 1935, for the first time in the world, a large telescope could be illuminized and illuminization gave a surface that would last for more than two years. Uh, and that's what we do today. That bell jar that you see there, that big metal jar, came up in 1935. It's still there. We still use it every couple of years. And all the mirrors on the mountain have to be re-illuminized in a vacuum chamber like this one. They pump it down. Uh, it, takes a couple, it takes a day or so. And then when it gets to the right level level, uh, they throw a switch and instantaneously everything inside that dome has a coating of aluminum. Einstein came up to Mount Wilson just once, 1931, and he was invited to uh, visit various parts of the mountain. Here he is inside the observing room of the 150-foot solar telescope looking through an eyepiece that is still there and that uh, Steve Padilla still uses. Um, the other person is Walter Adams uh, on the far right, and then uh, there is uh, Einstein at 1931, uh, didn't think his English was good enough, so he brought along his, uh, his interpreter for him. Now, something you probably didn't know is there is an Orange County connection to Mount Wilson. I mean, there's others, but this is the one I know about. On the Irvine Ranch, Michelson, of the first American to win a Nobel Prize, Albert Michelson, who did the speed of light experiment from Mount Wilson to Mount San Antonio, a distance of 22 miles, and he measured the speed of light in air very, very accurately, and he was very well credited for that for many, many years. But he started this on the Irvine Ranch, a vacuum tube in a cul in culvert pipe, three foot diameter uh, galvanized uh, corrugated pipe. And this is what it looked like in the observing room. He had, in this case, it was only a mile long, mirrors at both ends, and he sent the light back and forth uh, between six and, tw and 12 times, I believe. And, but that's what he had to do in order to measure the speed of light. I'll answer questions about that if anyone wants to know how you measured the speed of light in the 1920s and early 30s. Michelson passed away in about 1932, and uh, I had a question 
for uh, the man who trained me as a docent, Don Nicholson. Um, I asked him, did you, because he was there for some of the speed of light movements. He, was, he, he passed away uh, two years ago. Uh, he was 97 when he passed away. And he uh, could not recall that, you know, I asked him if Howard Hughes, who I worked for for over 35 years, well, I worked for, until he died, of course, uh, I worked for the company. Uh, I asked him if Hughes, who had the choice of any airport in Southern California, I asked him, did, why did he pick Santa Ana? Was it because there were Caltech people there on the Irvine Ranch a mile away? and they were good uh, with the calculations to measure, the, measure how fast his plane was going. And uh, he could say, he, I'd never heard of anything like that. But I talked to a guy, Tom Mahood, who had done a lot of research online about the measurement of the speed of light. And when uh, I found this thing, I said, oh, I see, Howard Hughes did his speed record at Santa Ana Airport in 1935. But by 1935, this experiment had been ruined by the Long Beach earthquake of 1933. So I said, oh, I guess that probably wasn't the reason. I think I've been barking up the wrong tree. And Tom Mahood emailed me back and said, no, no. There was a mile long tube right there. All he did was put his men with his stopwatches at either end and fly the plane over it. So Something you probably didn't know, and nor did, nor did I. Michelson did something else at Mount Wilson. He measured the diameter of stars. Frank Pease helped him design this, and this is the eyepiece he used for that. In the Chara Museum, if you've been up there, we, we now have a new device, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, there's the Center for High Angular Resolution Astronomy called Chara, and it is currently on Mount Wilson, the world's largest optical telescope by aperture. I have to qualify that. It is by aperture. It is 330 meters from one of the six telescopes to the other one, and that is the synthetic aperture that with modern computers you can use to image nearby stars. I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Let's move on. Edwin Hubble. Everybody knows that Edwin Hubble worked up there. He, um, he's, this is the famous picture you almost always see of him sitting on a Bentwood uh, chair at the Newtonian Focus, which is on a platform up about 50 feet above the floor. Um, Edwin Hubble was a man from Missouri. He, uh, his father wanted him to be a lawyer, so he got a law degree, and then he got sent to uh, Oxford. And when he was at Oxford, he studied astronomy because he was far enough away from his father. <laughs> and he'd already got his law degree. So um, he, uh, he wanted to do astronomy, and he did. He came back from Oxford with a fake English accent that he had for the rest of his life. He used to uh, uh, smoke that pipe constantly in all the pictures you see him in. And um, he, he would wear jodhpurs and stuff like that. Here he is with um, Einstein and Einstein's uh, assistant uh, and uh, Elmer, Ferdinand Elmer, just outside the uh, 150 foot solar tower in 1931. Hubble was very good at inserting himself to, into any famous photographs. He was very good about that. But he was also a very excellent uh, astronomer. And there's what made him famous. Not the only thing, but this is the first one. This is the plate that either he or perhaps his night assistant Milton Humason took of the very first variable star found in Andromeda. And they found that variable star, and then he found a whole bunch more, and by 1926 he had the, the makings of a paper. 
He didn't present the paper. And I, I'm surprised a man trained as a lawyer should have been able to present a paper, but he chose not to do it. He was, it was such a radical paper that he didn't do it himself. He sent somebody to the astronomical conference where it was presented. But the paper was how far away uh, the Andromeda galaxy, which was known as the Andromeda Nebula for many, many, for centuries, how far away it really was. Now he made a mistake in his calculations, but he wasn't too far off in astronomical terms. He thought it was about a million light years away, which meant it was definitely way outside the Milky Way. And uh, Harlow Shapley, who had worked there before him and was by, the time, by this time head of astronomy at Harvard, Harlow Shapley had actually found our place in the universe uh, he had realized that the Milky Way had more than just the Milky Way, but it, the, at the time he thought the Milky Way, and everybody else did, thought the Milky Way was the bulk of the uh, universe. So he had, by measuring uh, variable stars in globular clusters with a 60-inch telescope, Harlow Shapley had figured out that we weren't at the center of the universe. <laughs> so he was pretty proud of himself. He had actually figured out that the known universe, instead of being 30,000 light years across, was uh, at, to the farthest things he measured, about 300,000 light years. And he thought he'd, he'd made his way. He became head of astronomy at Harvard because of that. So he, uh, Harlow Shapley, moved on, and then Hubble uh, were both at the same uh, observatory for only, uh, they overlapped by about 18 months. Anyhow, this is Hubble's plate, the famous Hubble plate, and there were uh, a, a number of other plates it needed before they could uh, actually, you know, claim that they knew what they were doing. And of course, the other thing that Hubble did was he discovered the expansion of the universe and the fact that there were galaxies as far as he could see. All right. So this is, of course, a picture taken with the Hubble that I found online. And here's something else that you don't see in the tour at all, because this is the Newtonian cage, the one that Hubble himself was photographed at, the one picture you saw earlier. This is the Newtonian cage. It's now in the Smithsonian. So we have three of the cages up there, but this one isn't there anymore. You can't see it. When George Ellery Hale first got to California, he climbed Mount Wilson and he climbed through the clouds wondering if there, this mountain was as good as he had been told it was. And when he broke through the clouds, it was a day similar to this. And this picture was taken uh, of me by a French astronomer working for Chara uh, on the day that I told you about when uh, the transit of Mercury was happening and nobody showed up. Now, the top of the 150-foot solar tower, it looks like this. Einstein got up there. Uh, later on, Stephen Hawking came and he did not go up, as you might expect, but he did go in uh, to the observing room that I showed you earlier with Einstein looking through the eyepiece. He did go in there and they showed him around and he left his thumbprint and you can see it if you go on a tour today. By the way, to get up to the top, the only elevator built on a mountain built by a man whose fortune came from elevators is the one that takes you to the top of this tower. And I want to tell you, that is an e-ticket ride. When Steve allowed me to come up with him, as I got higher and higher and higher, I said, did I really want to do this? <laughs> but I was glad to get back down. So, Chara. Chara uh, was built in the lower parking lot and these six domes were all built. And then one day they hired one of these big helicopters 
and put them all into the six different places. And uh, this is how they did that. This is what Chara can do. This is a star, Regulus, that's been used by navigators for centuries to find their way in the world. But until Chara, we did not know. We knew it was spinning. We just didn't know it was spinning so much that it looked like this. <laughs> Regulus. And this, uh, we, when I first became a docent, they had finally gotten all six telescopes to play nice together. The thing about the six telescopes is, let's see if we can do this. Oh, went the wrong way. Yeah. Each, they're, they're, each telescope is connected to a long building where there are sleds that go back and forth. And the sleds have to be adjusted so that each of the six telescopes is looking at the exact same wave front of light. If you aren't on the same wave front, you can't do the interferometric measurements that make you possible, make it possible to image nearby stars, like I, the image that I showed you. Okay. Another thing you probably didn't know about George Ellery Hale and Mount Wilson is people from all over the world sent him letters and he responded to them. So here's a letter from Nikola Tesla in the day, 1908, when Nikola Tesla was being funded by uh, um, the big financer of the time, uh, Morgan, J.P. Morgan. So this is Tesla's Wardenclyffe on the letterhead. Tesla was building a, uh, a, a device that he was going to try to send free electricity to everybody. And when Morgan found out about it, he said, oh, that's not a good investment. So he cut him off. <laughs> but as you can see, the two had met and, and uh, they, they corresponded with each other. If you want another interesting uh, relationship to Mount Wilson, there's a, uh, a strange museum in Culver City. Culver City? Yeah, Culver City. Um, and there's a bunch of letters there uh, that were sent to people at Mount Wilson from people who you know, really didn't know astronomy. And it's kind of interesting. If you ever have a chance to go to that, that museum that was funded by a fellow who got a, uh, one of the uh, Genius Awards, the MacArthur Awards. Okay. The floats that the 100 foot inch, yeah, the 100 inch telescope floats on were built at the Four River Shipyard. Most of the telescope moving parts were built at the Four River Shipyard in Massachusetts. Uh, I figured out that because of the dates of the building of the telescope, these parts were so big that they had to come a new way to get to Mount Wilson. Some of these parts were sent through the Panama Canal, which was brand new back then. I want to mention that when I was this age, that's me, the little guy, the 100 inch telescope was still the world's largest telescope. I'll bet you there's a few people here that have the same claim to fame. Thanks for having me here tonight. Questions? Question? Yeah, the road that exists that going, going up to Mount Wilson now, is that the road that the telescope went up or did it come up through Pasadena? The road that everything before 1935, the road, he asked the question, what is the road that we go up to Mount Wilson today, the road that the parts for the telescope came up? And the answer is no. 
Before 19, everything that got up there before 1935 came up the toll road, the one that I showed you that electric truck on. That's the road that everything came up before 1935. After that, uh, thanks to the Great Depression, there was some money available for road work and Red Box Road and the Angeles Crest Highway were built with Worked Progress Administration money. Another question. I got another question. The, the, guy that was, uh, the, the guys that were working four hours and they had to use that guide star, did they have to manually adjust the scope to keep tracking that or how did that work? Okay, the question is, did the people who had to, uh, the uh, observers and their night assistants, did they have to uh, uh, manipulate the scope themselves or how did it work? Uh, the answer is there was also a telescope operator working in the dark and he would keep the telescope moving at the right speed and making certain that everything, uh, that the, uh, he, his job was to make certain that the slit of the dome followed the movement of the telescope itself because it wasn't automatic. So that was his job. And then the, 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 the observer himself had a couple of wheels you can see it in the uh, pictures. Let me, let me go back to that picture. Okay, let's go to this one. That'll be close enough, I think. See those? Okay. See these wheels here? Here and here? X and Y? Those adjust this whole frame with the, with the, uh, um, with the glass plate negative located where this is. And it would then put the uh, fine, uh, fo fo the fine adjust would then put the star in the right place for the exposure. Uh, but they, it, it had some limitations, of course. As I say, this, the whole thing would be moving across the sky at the sidereal speed, but um, the, uh, the fine adjustment would be moving this whole plate with this knob and this knob. Okay, another question? What has been your most recent and most rewarding experience as a docent? That's a good question. That's a very good question. Uh, I was asked what, what is my most, what, what, what did you say? Rewarding. Re rewarding, yes, okay. Well, I'm rewarded every time I go up there with people who appreciate what I do. I hope that's true here too. Uh, I would also say that we now have a program on the mountain uh, where you can go up in the daytime, if you want, on a Sunday and listen to music in that 100-inch dome, which has acoustics similar to acoustics in uh, great uh, cathedrals and such. Uh, the musicians who come up there, they really enjoy it, and the people who come up to see it appreciate it too. We, we finished our, we've had a monthly concert uh, all through the year. Uh, the last one was the past Sunday. Uh, and we're done for this year, but next year, uh, starting in March, we'll have another series of concerts. That's one thing that I enjoy because I used to sing. Um, you can't see it, hear it in my voice today, but I used to sing. And uh, that uh, is something I enjoy. But there's also a lecture series, and there is one more lecture, I believe, or maybe two uh, this year, before the uh, year is out. Uh, and it'll be later this month. And for the $25 fee to uh, enjoy that lecture at 5 o'clock, 5.30 in the uh, museum, uh, there's a lecture hall in the back of the museum about the same size as this room. And for that $25, you get a chance to stand in line and get a chance to look through the world's largest telescope until, uh, until 1948. The world's largest telescope until I was six years old. Another question. What? Why is the 100-inch telescope called the Hooker? Okay, why is the 100-inch telescope called the Hooker? Well, a Mr. Hooker 
unlike Mr. Spence, lived long enough to give the money for the making of that uh, glass lens. Now his, uh, uh, George Ellery Hale had a nice relationship with the hookers, but it was maybe a little too nice with Mr. Hooker's wife. Uh, they were very close and Mr. Hooker wasn't too fond of that. But at some point, you know, because of the problems with the glass and everything, uh, he had once said, I believe, I wish that thing would be sunk to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> he, there were troubles. So I thank you very much, and I'll say goodnight. Glad you appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, ah. Is it still a working telescope? Oh, yes. Yes. Because you should have asked me that question. I know, but it's always heard that the lights from the city Yes. Were. The lights from the city are a problem. However, there are certain things that it can do. Um, for instance, uh, there's the Juno probe that's going around Jupiter. And one of the things that is bright enough for it to be able to see very well are the moons of Jupiter. There is a worry that the Juno can, you know, because it's on a very elliptical orbit. It comes in very, very fast around Jupiter. And so there's a worry that th those um, orbits might interfere with the moon. So we wanted to make sure that we knew the orbits of some of the bigger moons. And uh, I, by the way, um, Don Nicholson's father was Seth Nicholson. Seth Nicholson was the first man to... Uh, discover four more moons of Jupiter uh, using the first the Lick telescope and then the 100 inch hooker. And he did that, you know, before uh, we had sent any space probes to Jupiter. Now, of course, the number of, um, um, the number of uh, moons of Jupiter has risen now into the 90s, I believe, because we keep discovering more of them. Wow. Okay? Yeah, but why did they build Palomar then? Oh, well, Palomar is still working. And so, uh, Palomar, Palomar is a mountain that was chosen uh, alongside Mount Wilson. And I think that they would have built the, the whole observatory on Palomar if there had been a railroad nearby. They uh, really needed the connection to the Santa Fe Railroad down there in Pasadena in order to uh, get the parts they needed and to get the astronomers to the telescope. Palomar was just too far away at that time. Well, of course, once they built the road up yeah. to Palomar, automobiles you know, were very, very common by that exactly. point. And, the, and, the and I think you may, uh, some of the people, I know uh, teachers I knew when I went to school in Santa Ana, tell me, told me that when they took the mirror, the 200 inch mirror from Caltech, where they had polished it, to Palomar, kids were let out of school to see it go by. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah. <laughs> I have another question for you. Yeah. There's going to be another transit of Mercury November 11th. Okay. Uh, is, is there going to be something going on at Mount Wilson? I don't know. Because of what happened the last time, you'll just have to uh, go to the Mount Wilson website and see if there is an event scheduled. I, I talked them into that, that, that one, and they, they weren't too happy when people didn't show up. Thank you very much. It was a fascinating yeah. lecture. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, how did they measure the, in 1933, how did they measure the speed of light? Oh, speed of light. Actually, they did that in the 1920s. And that was a fascinating story for me, too, because Seth Nicholson did tell me. Apparently, uh, they had a battleship searchlight. Yeah. And then they took the light from the battleship searchlight and put it through a slit. So they threw most of that light away. But they had enough light going through that slit. And then they had a 12-sided uh, mirror. There was 12, 12 mirrors. And they spun it up on an air bearing. It sounded like a siren when it was in operation. So you had the hissing of the arc light, the, the noise of the siren. It had to be a very loud system. But actually, so what, when they sent the light through the slit on the first mirror, it was then... Uh, optically projected across the 22 miles to another uh, big mirror 
on Mount San Antonio, the slopes of Mount San Antonio. Yeah. There, they had a retro mirror, a small mirror that, that it was then re, re uh, collimated and sent back. And when they looked through the eyepiece, they would see the return reflection on the next mirror over. And with a micrometer, they could measure how far it had moved over. So they knew, and, and then, I, then I had to ask the question, well, how did they know how fast that air bearing was spinning? The answer is they used a tuning fork. Yes, they would tune the tuning fork, and when they had the beat frequency of the air bearing and the, the fork measured, it was an adjustable tuning fork, when they adjusted it and they got the beat frequency, then they would measure the tuning fork, they could know the speed very, very precisely. This is called interferometry, in this case, audible interferometry, but you can do it optically as well. And this is what uh, uh, Michelson was very good at. Michelson invented, you, you may know that Michelson and Morley were the ones who discovered that there was no such thing as the luminiferous, pardon me, luminiferous ether. In other words, ether theory, which had, they figured if, if, if light is a wave, it has to have a medium to pass through. So they for, formulated luminiferous ether, had to be there. Michelson found that it wasn't there. So we still don't quite know what light is. <laughs> Isn't that so? well, thank luminiferous, you so much. luminiferous ether, because of course, you know, uh, um, amongst others, um, Rutherford and, and uh, Einstein and others had figured out that light had the duality of a particle and a wave. And it's the wave that, that, that you, you say, okay, waves, sound waves have to pass through a medium. Nobody can hear you screaming in space because there's no air, a medium. But in uh, light, you don't need a medium. So that's that's what, yeah, that's what Michelson did. Ingenious. Well, that's what they gave him the Nobel Prize for. Yes, I can understand that. First American to get it. Yeah, well, thank you again. You're welcome. Thanks a million. That's a good presentation. I'm I'm glad you appreciated it. I do. All right.